All right, welcome back. Um, I have titled this one over my different outlines, uh, Canoe Esoterica, uh, The Weird Stuff, and really it's what canoes should know. Um, and you're going to recognize the scene. Uh, this is where we filmed Kevlar's Light. This is the beach that Claire and I and Dash paddled back to on our paddle home trip. Um, and what I've got is four different boats. I've got a whitewater boat, a racing boat, um, and two touring boats. Uh, and uh, we're just going to discuss a little bit about how canoes work. And so first of all, we want to talk about why stiffness equals performance. So why is this boat, the race boat, so much more efficient to paddle than a Royal X boat? Well, partly it's the shape, of course, and all the things that I talked about composites earlier. But beyond that, it's the fact that every time I plant the paddle and I move the boat forward, that race boat goes as far forward as possible because there's been no flex of the boat um, that's absorbed some of that paddle stroke. So every bit of my energy from the paddle stroke has moved the boat forward. If I had, an alum if I had one of the aluminum and plastic Mohawk paddles or a Carlisle down here, I would flex that blade and show you how flexible those blades are and say, guess why these things are inefficient? The blade moves. If you want efficiency, you're going to paddle with a carbon fiber paddle, or at least a stiff wood one. You're not going to paddle with a floppy paddle because guess what? They're not efficient. They don't move you forward as effectively. Um, and now I want to talk for a second about interpersonal dynamics in tandem boats. Um, these are called divorce boats for a reason, and it's largely because people don't understand how they work and they're poor communicators. <laughs> so there are plenty of people that have paddled for 20 years and still don't really understand what each person's experience and role can be in the boat. So first of all, the experience. The stern paddler has a much bigger impact on how tippy the boat feels than the bow paddler. And why is that? Generally speaking, the stern paddler is heavier. Um, and so they have more impact if they scratch their butt um, and you've got my 210 pounds in the stern and you've got Claire's 135 pounds in the bow, she feels it a lot. If she scratches her butt, I don't feel it much. She's that much lighter than I am. She has that much less impact on how the boat behaves. Um, number two, when we get in, when we get rocking and rolling in the waves, or if I just lean the boat over and heel it and put it up on, put it up on the shoulder here, Take a look for a second, right in the sun, sorry, um, at how much boat there is in front of me. I can see this gunnel as it dips in, dips close to the water, or even as it goes into the water. And I feel super comfortable about that because I know exactly what's happening. I can watch it all. Now let's zoom up. Guess what she sees? This is what your wife, your daughter, your son, your partner sees, your husband. When the boat leans over, nothing. All they do is feel it. It's dramatic what the impact is when it's feeling versus seeing. Because seeing, you say, ah, you know, there's five more inches of gunnel out of the water. We got nothing to worry about, honey. Feeling is, I just felt like I was about to go over. I don't like that feeling. And so always respect the fact that the bow paddler doesn't have the same experience as the stern paddler. That's why these things are divorce boats. You can terrify your bow paddlers, especially you bigger people, generally males. Um, if you're 250 pounds and you're paddling with a 120 pounder, she can't do anything about what's going on in the boat. He, your son, can't do anything about what's going on in the boat. It took me years to finally understand that, but I paddled with a guy that was probably 290, 300, and he liked to sit on the stern deck of the boat. And oh my God, I weighed 200 and some odd pounds. And it was a terrifying experience to have him back there, even though he was a good paddler. Um, realize the experience realize the experience that the bow paddler has. Number two, empower your bow paddler to steer the boat. I can't emphasize that enough. We're going to swing over to a whitewater boat. If you take a whitewater boat, and of course, this, imagine that's a tandem whitewater boat, so it's got two pedestals in it. If you take a tandem whitewater boat down the Grand Canyon, the more experienced paddler is in the bow. Why? Because they choose the route and because they can make micro adjustments to avoid rocks. They see a rock coming up quickly and they dodge it. Um, that stern paddler just follows them. The same thing is true when you paddle white water in a touring boat. If when Claire and I paddle, you know, the Hayes River, when we've paddled the Snake River and the Northern Yukon together, the Kazan River, 
here's how it goes. I've got more experience in whitewater than she does. And so I say, hey, I think we should run that line. I'm going to set us up for that. And so I'm going to swing the boat over toward that. She's going to help me some. But when we get into the rapid, she's the one that sees the rock. She sees the rocks, what, 12 feet faster than I do? And she's blocking my sight lines. And so guess what? She makes the adjustment around the rock. She's the one doing the draw strokes, the crossbow draws, if you want to do prize. She's doing all those things, and I'm following her. Now let's talk about flat water, because that's the more applicable thing for most people. When you come into a portage landing, let that bow paddler teach that bow paddler, empower that bow paddler to do draw strokes and bring you into that landing. If you're having trouble turning the boat around a sharp corner of, little, of the Little Indian Sioux River or the Moose River, have your bow paddler help you. It is amazing if you empower your bow paddler, if you allow them to steer, what the impact can be. Um, and so now let's talk about the where people are in the boat. So first of all, you need to trim the boat. So I keep talking about 200 pounds and 130 pounds. So it's 130 up there, 200 pounds back there. Um, how do you make that boat work? Well, the first thing that you've got to do is realize that a boat is a teeter-totter. And we'll go, we'll go deeply into this in just a little bit. But in short, actually, let's go into it right now. Who cares? Um, in short, if I've got 135 right here, I want to put some weight up here to even us out if we're on a day trip. Or if we're on a trip, I'm going to put all the heavy stuff right here. I'm not going to put much back in here. Now, of course, what's happened to us over the years is Claire is, you know, still 135 pounds, but now Dash was 30 pounds, and so they're pretty close to my weight comparatively. But the bigger the spread you've got, the more you've got to put weight forward. You can do a sliding seat, but then you're locked into a sitting position and your seat occupies a lot of space in the boat. It's a cumbersome apparatus that's also noisy and costs more and adds weight and is, you know, not the most elegant thing in the world, frankly. Um, and so we really prefer to go with a fixed seat and then say, hey, you know what? A day trip? Put the weight right here. Because why? The balance point of the canoe, if I put weight right here, here's, here's where the canoe balances. You know, if I pick it up, oh boy, I'm going to hurt my back. <laughs> That's Royal X. <laughs> anyway, um, if I put weight right here, it doesn't have much impact on the trim of the boat, how level the boat is. On the other hand, if I put weight way up here, holy buckets, is there a big impact. And so realize that where you place the weight affects how the boat performs. Um, also, if you want to have a boat perform, and we're going to do this on a solo because it's easier to describe it, but if I want this boat to track, I'm going to put the weight way up here and way back there. If I want the boat to be the most buoyant thing possible in big waves or in white water, I'm going to put the weight right here and right here and i know you're looking at a whitewater boat and saying you're not going to load that boat up with a whole bunch of stuff and you're right but i'm in general on solo boats that's the case um why are solo boats paddled from the center instead of from the stern or the bow the way that people want to paddle tandem boats because you get the best control over the boat i can paddle both ends of the boat i'm centered which means i control the whole boat this thing is 12 feet, something like that, so it's not long. But imagine if I've got a 14, a 15, a 16 foot solo canoe, I've got eight feet on either end of me. That's a lot of leverage over your paddle stroke if you're off center. So swing over here. What if we yank this thwart out and paddle it backwards? What have I got there? 12 feet away from me is the end of that boat? That's got a ton of leverage. That's why I want to be centered. Um, so, and then, look at this race boat for a second. Look at how far back that seat is, how tight that area is. And again, look at the bow. You can move that way, way forward. And why in race boats do you want to be way out on the ends? Because you maximize the flatness of it. And that's not the way to put it. Let's try that one more time. You maximize how well it tracks. Um, the further out on the ends you are, the harder that boat is to turn, the easier it is to make a track. 
The closer to the middle everything is, the easier it is to turn, the harder it is to make a track. Those are the trade-offs. And you can affect that on a boat like this by where you place the weight. You can affect that especially in your solo canoes. You can have big impacts on those things. Um, and then we've got sitting and kneeling. And you can see rigged out with knee pads, I'm a kneeler. Uh, now we swing over to the race boat, total sitting. Look at how low those seats are. Um, what's, which, which one should you go with? Well, obviously it depends on whether your knees work or not. That's probably the biggest criteria. After that though, it just depends on which way you're most comfortable. Realize that with kneeling, you've got three points of contact. You know, you've got two knees and a butt that are all bearing weight. And of course your thighs and your calves are down low, which really reduces your center of gravity a lot. And so you are most stable when you kneel. If you have sitting seats rigged super low, you can, you can get some of that benefit back. So that's a pretty significant piece. And then kneeling, you have better rotation, which is why all the kneelers um, want to be, sorry, all the whitewater paddlers are kneeling because it allows you to reach to your sides better. You know, you can reach around behind you from a kneeling position and away from a sitting position. You're just not very open. Your body's not open. Your hips don't swivel at all. Um, equally, you can reach further forward from a sitting position. So racers always sit. Um, and it's, it's trade-offs. You, you can see this boat is rigged for kneeling, but we sit in it all the time. And actually, the B-17 is exactly the same way, but I wanted to show it with skirts, so you're going to see that as well. We'll come to that in just a little bit. Um, realize that the seat height affects the stability, which is why these seats aren't super duper high. We want to be low enough that we've still got good stability and high enough that we can get our feet under the seats. I've got size 15s. Flexible soles. I can't tell you, <clears throat> I can't emphasize how much you need to get flexible soles if you're going to kneel and you've got big feet. It ain't going to you aren't going to kneel if you've got big feet and be safe if you want to wear hiking boots. It doesn't matter what anybody tells you. Don't hesitate to cut down the drops. You can see that these are not standard drops. Um, I've just modified them to what I like. Um, you can see a foot brace in the race boat and you'll notice, sorry for the sun, there's not one in the stern, or sorry, there's not one in the bow. We get asked for foot braces in the bow. They don't make any sense. It's too small of an area, doesn't work. In the stern though, um, the foot brace works fine, and by the way, that other piece is a self-bailing mechanism uh, for when you get water in it, uh, and you want to empty it and keep paddling as fast as you possibly can. Um, anyway, foot brace helps transfer, transfer your energy to the paddle because it locks you in place. It is a way to increase um, how attached to the boat you are. You can also do that with packs if you're a tripper. Um, so foot braces, much like sliding seats, are one of those things that we'll do it if people want us to. And we do offer them. But we don't believe that they're necessity for most paddlers. Um, so if you want a foot brace, by all means get one. We can do it. Um, they do certainly help if you're paddling unloaded the majority of the time. And then, actually wait, let's swing over to knee pads first. So you'll notice I've got glued in knee pads. And why is that? Because it's easier to portage them. Instead of having loose ones that are forever, you've always got to deal with um, when, you're, uh, when you're portaging the boat. Uh, also, if you do take a swim, you're not chasing your knee pad down the river or having it tethered to the boat and having a, a potential entrapment issue. Um, so that's why gl glued in for the tripping boats. If I brought down other boats, you would see no knee pads with the intention that I just have them loose for paddling out there. Um, because you can get more comfortable and you can adjust more uh, with the loose ones. And so then here we see pedestals and thigh straps. So what's going on there? I am as locked in as I can possibly be because not only do I have a thigh strap, I've got a knee strap too. Um, I am anchored to that boat. and You'll see the foot pedals as well. Um, all those things mean that I wear that boat much more significantly than I can wear even that tandem boat. Um, and that's important for whitewater. Um, let's see, let's jump into float bags and spray skirts a little bit, just talk about those. And that is, you can see this thing is outfitted for float bags, all whitewater canoes are. Um, if I was a hardcore whitewater boater, 
I would have lots of foam glued in here and all that into things, but I'm not a hardcore play boater at all. That's not my world. I'm a tripper. Um, I've used that, this boat to paddle down the gates of Lador in Utah, to paddle down Desolation Gray in Utah, um, and places like that, where you paddle, you know, 70, 80 miles. You've got some flat water, you've got some white water. Um, you can have fun in a white water boat and not be stuck in the same little area uh, for the whole day which is what park and play does. And that just, for me, is not fascinating. Um, I totally get why people are fascinated by it, and, and, but it's not my world. And so anyway, float bags. Let's jump into float bags a little bit more. What does a float bag really do? It does two things. Number one, for these whitewater paddlers, it displaces all this area. And if I was to glue foam in here, I would make it so the boat just couldn't hold very much water. So even if I went through a big wave, the boat just wouldn't fill up with very much water. And then I just go to shore and empty it. Now let's swing over to what a tandem boat does that way. And so this is a lazy man's bag system. It's not a full system by any stretch of the imagination. Because for a tandem boat, a float bag is cheap insurance. That's all it is. Um, so in the stern, Basically what I've got, you can see these little D-rings, all little D-rings, um, and a couple of bag anchors. So the ability to create a lace system for an end bag that's just right there. And so what's that? That's cheap insurance if we go swimming, that the boat floats high enough that it's, we're not af afraid of it wrapping. What's all this? Tie-outs for packs so that we don't lose those. Um, so it's ways to handle big whitewater remote rivers and to have float bags and gear um, center bags are a better choice if you're um if you're just paddling local whitewater um, but end bags are the place to put them because of course i want buoyancy in my ends therefore the bag goes there the gear goes near the yoke um, that's why um, and then we've got spray skirts and so what's the difference between this and a float bag so spray skirts are a little bit different in the way that they work. Um, they're trying to keep the water out of the boat, literally. Um, and uh, so they help with splash a great deal. So if we're running white water and we're going through lots of little splashy stuff, even big splashy stuff, they're wonderful that way. Um, and uh, they help with wave action so they keep the water out of the boat when you get into big waves like when we were paddling on superior and you get a lot of you get splash action from the waves um so they minimize they minimize your need much like that self baler on the race boat they minimize your need to worry about what's going on with the boat you can focus on your paddling um what else do spray skirts do they keep you warm when it's cold. That's a big deal. They keep the wind out of the boat so they don't let you get blown around as much because the top is sealed. Um, so really what I would say is if you are looking for safety in whitewater, float bag, especially local paddling. If you are looking for expedition whitewater, spray skirt, and you might even consider combining that with those end bags. So you can see that this thing, this boat has both snaps and is rigged out for bags. Um, and then I've got two things left. Sorry, I'll twist us. But I'm going to go need to get another boat. And I can't portage aluminum by myself without hurting myself. And so we're going to take a pause. And I'm going to have my wife Claire help me out a little bit. And then we're going to come back again. So we'll see you in a minute. All right. We are looking at the old Grumman. This is the boat that I grew up in. Uh, it's the one that my dad took me into Northwest Ontario on a lot of family fishing trips. In fact, you can see some of the old Ontario Park stickers. Look at that, 1966. And there's a couple on the other side too that are even in worse shape. Most of them have fallen off over the years. Um, the other thing you can see on this is a 2018 sticker. Uh, I licensed it in 2016, not to paddle it, but to put it out on this beach with another couple of Grummans that we put, put a platform on top of, and that's where my wife and I got married. It seemed like the most fitting place. 
Uh, and the other place that you may recognize this boat from is the Kevlar's light video. Uh, this is the aluminum that Jerry was paddling around and carrying. But why are we looking at a Grumman in this uh, video? Well, it's got two features that we should talk about quick. Number one, it's got a recurve stem. And so a recurve stem is a stem that's got that nice recurve to it. A modern stem would be raked for the most part. Occasionally they're plumb if you've got a race boat and you really feel the need to create a high wear area, high wear area right at the edge of that plumb stem. But the great thing about a little bit of rocker and a rake stem is you end up spreading out that wear area. But recurve stem. Let's just talk about that for a second. Why did older boats have recurve stems? And let's talk about birch bark. Most birch bark canoes had a recurve stem. Why? Because they have a wood bends in a beautiful arc. Um, and that's the way that you could make a boat. You can't make a plum stem or a rake stem with wood and bend it in that shape. Um, so that's birch bark canoes and that was wood canvas canoes as well too. Um, why on the Grumman? Well, guess what? They followed what the other people had done and they said, hey, that's what people seem to like. Let's make it that way. Um, and so why have we gone away from recurve stems? Well, if you want to race, and this is what you saw on the race boat, you do a plumb stem because you maximize the water line. So you maximize the tracking and you minimize maneuverability. Why do we do a rake stem on most modern boats? Because it's the most efficient, um, because it gives you a blend of maneuverability as well as tracking. Why not a recurve stem? Well, again, look at the shape of this rake. Look at all this material that's unused that really doesn't have any impact, especially anything above the waterline here has a detracts from the performance of the boat, does not improve the performance of the boat. And what do I mean by that? Well, it creates extra windage and it creates extra weight. Um, so what's the point? Well, of course we do it on the Saliga because that's a historic boat. And there's a fair number of people out there that want canoes to look like they did historically. And the Saliga is a historic design. I mean, that's one of the reasons that we make it. Um, and aesthetically speaking, recurve stems make for beautiful images, beautiful photos, beautiful sense of history. And so if you want recurve stems, definitely get recurve stems. But if you want to make your life the easiest, if you want to maximize your efficiency, and you've heard the word efficiency a lot, and truly it's just making life easier, you want rake stems. They're the things that make the most sense. Um, they're the ones that also make for the best performance. And then there's one other thing that this boat has. Look at the keel. And again, let's go to history. Of course, they couldn't quite put keels on birch bark boats, which means they had to patch them all the time. And then wood canvas boats came out and they said, oh, we can put keels on these things. That way we won't have to patch our canvas all the time because the keel is what you get the abrasion on. And that way you protect your canvas. Why does an aluminum boat have a keel? It joins the two halves together. Why do modern boats, Kevlar, composite boats, carbon fiber, you name it, not have keels? Because they don't do any good. Um, what does this do really? It joins the halves together. It's a sacrificial layer. There's a healthy number of aluminum paddlers still out there that will make the argument that a keel helps with tracking. But let's just take a look at that statement for a second. So the water line on this boat, you know, if it's going to be in the water, it's going to sink up to about there. Maybe even here. That's why the splash rail's there. This is a square stern, by the way. Um, so we've got this much boat in the water and this much keel out of the water in the water as well. Tell me the surface area of that keel has any real impact on the tracking of the boat. There's way too much boat, way too little keel in the water to have any notable impact. A keel on a sailboat has a notable impact. A keel on a sailboat keeps it from tipping over with the mast and that end of things. A keel on a canoe has no real purpose. It's obsolete at this point in time. Now there's one argument that those aluminum paddlers make that I'll grant. And that is that a keel does help prevent side slip a bit. And so that is, if you want to start at the 
uh, to calm into the lake and get blown down the lake in the wind fishing the whole time, a keel will slow, you, slow that process down, help you not drift as quickly. Um, and they go, yeah, 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 yeah. And then it's like, okay, let's stop and think about your statement for a second. You just said that the keel slows you down, that it's inefficient, that it makes your boat travel more slowly. Uh, yeah. Well, guess what? It doesn't have any good benefits. Why don't you just side slip a little faster and make it easier to paddle over the whole distance of your trip? So, that's keels, recurve stems. Um, thanks for listening. So I almost signed off, and I've got one more thing, and I failed to mention what this boat is. This is a Hassle Pro. This is a boat that, this is Ted's boat. Uh, this is the boat that he won the Border to Border Triathlon in. And what is the Border to Border? It's a Minnesota Triathlon. You start on the southern border of the state and you run, bike, and of course you canoe because we're in Minnesota, all the way to the northern border. So about 500 miles of travel. Uh, and he and a team of three other guys won the relay version. 2005, thereabouts. Um, and uh, so yeah, that's why, that's why this race boat uh, is decked out with flames. All right, we are back one more time. This is just going to be brief. These are the things I missed. <laughs> um, number one, I want to talk about Relix boats for a second and what you can do with plastics. And this goes back to the boats as teeter-totters. So let's talk history for a second. Mad River introduced the Explorer in Relix, and they also introduced the Freedom in Relix. Those two boats were the same hull. They were literally, they came out of the same mold. What did Mad River do to create and make them different? On the Freedom, sorry, let's do the Explorer first. On the Explorer, the seats were further forward. On the Freedom, they were closer to the center. The Freedom was a better whitewater boat because they moved those seats in tighter. On a whitewater tandem, those pedestals are right next to each other. Maximum buoyancy in the ends. On a race boat, Minimum buoyancy on the ends, maximum tracking. We said that already. But now let's go back to the Freedom and Explorer discussion. And that is, the other thing that they did on that Freedom was they increased the length of the thwarts. Why? You spread the center of the boat out, you lift up the end, you create more rocker with the same hull. So all those things were ways to make that Freedom be a better whitewater boat, that Explorer be a better general purpose boat. Oh, sorry, one more, th couple more things that I failed to mention about this boat. You see the cane seat in the back, you see the web seat in the front. The web seat is the new one, the cane seat is the old one. We replaced the cane seat because it blew out. That's why North Stars are all web. They last longer. Why is it missing the deck? Because a friend who borrowed it should learn that grab handles are for picking boats up. Decks are not for picking boats up. Unless it's a wood trim North Star where the deck is structural. Um, race boats. Why does it have that cover on it? The same reason that that one has a cover over there. If you want to minimize windage, you're going to just have cockpits exposed. The cockpits need to be exposed in a race boat because you need to be able to jump out quick and portage it. The cockpits are sealed in a touring whitewater boat because you can take your time to get out. So what this has actually got is a zippered section that allows us to drop in and then zip and prevent water from pooling and then a high area as well um, and let's see what else did i miss i think we've covered it all and i'll show you my audience for a second there's my pa there's my paddling partners there's claire and dashwa bear signing off